This is the Fantasy Road Show. Welcome back to another episode of the Fantasy Road Show. This episode is brought to you by Rule One Proteins. If you're looking to get back in the gym or just looking to re-up your supplement game, go check out Rule One Proteins. They got they got the best protein powder on the market, the best supplements, the best vitamins. You name it, they got it. Go check them out at www.ruleoneproteins.com. Thank you for clicking on the video. Please like and subscribe to the channel. You guys know the drill. My name is Truck. I'm joined, as always, by Culls and Shane O'Mac. And today we have a very special guest for you. We have the Prince of Italy, the bad boy of the Titans fan base, creator of It's Pronounced Taki, Vince Taki. Vince, how you doing, buddy? Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. I'm feeling good. Excited to be here. Uh, it's been an exciting football offseason already. Uh, glad to be on this awesome pod. Let's go. I uh, So Vince and I go way back. He already has me cracking up before the episode. Uh, he just right as we're going online, he goes, is that a UCA jersey? I had to rock uh, UCA for our boy Jay Harks. Yeah. Uh, that's how we met way back in the day in high school. Um, so I wasn't intending on him on seeing it before the episode, but literally right as we go on. Uh, he has me laughing, so I love it. Super excited for the episode. VT's an awesome guy. He has a lot of insight into the uh, Titans, um, you know, just team as a whole. Um, but, yeah, I think, you know, we'll kick it off with kind of a conversational interview and just find out, you know, where you're from, your background, how you became a Titans fan, uh, and where that, you know, where that passion comes from. And, uh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, cool. I mean, I'm from Chicago. I'm from the Chicago area. I live in Chicago. I live in the city now uh, with my wife and, and daughter. Um, my love for the Titans started, um, I, I, I guess it's kind of a weird time to, in a way, because like I wasn't much of a football fan growing up. I loved basketball. It was really my first love as a sport, but I watched the, the Titans Rams Super Bowl. And when Kevin Dyson, long story short is when Kevin Dyson got tackled at the one, I started sobbing um just 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 crying my eyes out the really only things i remember from that game were um isaac bruce is like go ahead touchdown late and then you know the 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 last final drive comeback that got stopped uh, right at the one and i just started sobbing uh, my mom asked me like what's wrong vince and i said I'm a, I'm a titans fan mom and like ever since then it's uh the times are my thing like i just i love titans football um it's my uh I've been a kind of a lonely fan just given where I live and like geographically, I've never, you know, I have no real ties to Nashville. Um, I've been, you know, uh, I, I've been a uh, frequenter and, and taking advantage of any sort of online forums and communities to, to keep my Titans fandom, you know, going throughout this, throughout the season and off season. Um, just it's, it's a huge, huge, huge part of my life. Um, for better or for worse, and even though we're a smaller market organization uh, that's that's going through some transition, a big transition this off season, um, I, I I just I, it's a twenty four seven relationship for me. So I I'd never heard that story. That's that's awesome. So you were literally just watching the game. And yeah, I was like nine years old. Not a fan of the Titans, and you know they made you feel something down deep, and you're like, I, I yeah, love, I love the Titans. I that's love great. them, and yeah, and it, and I think you guys know like when just the, the the feeling down inside deep, whether your team is struggling or not, like the little things you just latch on to. Um, it's it's the it's the drug of of sports fandom. I love it. Well, congratulations on uh, your daughter. Thank you. Um, is she get? Does she have her first Titan swag? Have you? She's got. Yeah, she's had a lot of Titan swag. She uh, she was born in April, so she was part of the draft last year. Um, you know, she's so witnessed Levis's. Uh, you know, um, Levis getting the nod in, in week seven or whatever it was. She's she she bleeds two tone blue. Yeah, I guess my one piece of advice would be when she's when you teach her to eat bananas to peel. Yeah, of course. Banana. No, no mayonnaise in the coffee. Good point. Yeah. Good point. Uh, yeah. there, there's lines we draw. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> well, I love it. Let's get into the Titans. That's why we're here, man. Um, so I kind of think starting off with the coaching change is probably a great way to start. So Callahan, to me, was a great hire. I want to hear your thoughts there. Yeah, um, I mean, the coaching, it was – I'm not, I don't want to talk, you know, I want to talk focus on, on Callahan, but I, I would say like, you know, Vrabel was a phenomenal and I think is a phenomenal coach. Um, 
did did a lot of special things for the organization. But I, like as a fan, there were weird tea leaves kind of throughout the season. So I, I never felt that Vrabel was potentially on the outs more than than really as this as the season progressed. So when when we did make the decision to to make a change at head coach, um, it was it was. It was it was strange because like what a, what a phenomenal coach that brought such an identity and culture and and, and overall a winning a winning um, um, experience to the team. But I'm very excited for Brian Callahan. Um, obviously, wasn't overly familiar with him, you know, prior um, to 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 us even starting an interview. I think oftentimes like offensive coordinators from offensive staffs are often overlooked a little bit and not the hottest names, but. Um, coaching tree speaks for itself, obviously, you know, just grew up in locker rooms, um, through, through his dad, Bill, but, um, over, over the course of his career has worked for a variety of different coaches, variety of different schemes. I don't think he comes from one particular, I know he doesn't come from one particular branch, but so it's like, he's got exposure through like a John Gruden offense, um, um, Gary Kubiak offense by, by proxy Sean McVay offense. And I think even what Cincinnati did um, and has done over the past years with Joe Burrow, like, and just that, that team as a whole has, has evolved and flexed to, 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 to not be even the same, not only season to season, but game to game. Um, they did a really nice job once, once Burrow went down um, in, in, in the middle of last season. Um, I, I think that as a, as a Titans fan, as an organization, we have, for better or for worse, really stuck to kind of a black and blue football, run the ball, play defense uh, mentality, regardless of where our coaches, regardless of where our coaches have been. I don't know if that's necessarily going to change with with Callahan. I think there's truths to playing good and successful football, but but something I'm just very excited about with with Brian Callahan's hire is is a commitment to to looking to make some fundamental changes offensively and and invest in the person who is, in my opinion, the single most important person in the building, and that's Will Levis. Yeah, you mentioned um, – so you mentioned identity. Uh, I don't want to jump to Bra- Vrabel. I want to give Callahan his too, but um, how does the Titans keep that identity that I – mean, I mean, Vrabel, that's what he brought to the team. He kind of created that culture. You want to keep that as an organization, but you also want to – um, move on to the next evolution um, of the team and offense, like you just mentioned with Callahan. So, how do you kind of keep that identity while letting Callahan still take the reins? Totally, yeah. And I, I think if I remember correctly, I think Callahan alluded to it a little bit in his press conference. And these are these are cliches, but but just like the physical element of football is never going to go away. And then that was Vrabel's mo almost to a fault. Like we were making, um, you know, fifty-three man personnel decisions based on guys who were just more physical, less. But not necessarily even the more talented guys who can help on a game to game basis. So I, I think that the physical element and even the the hiring of Denard Wilson as our defensive coordinator out of out of Baltimore, just like vi- violent, fast blitz blitz centric foot blitz centric defense, uh, which wasn't necessarily our mo in our previous regime. I, I think these are just truths of of playing successful football and w- and winning football games that that Kalen is going to be consistent with. Just the prioritization of an offensive line. And keeping your quarterback upright, and obviously, like Kale Hans made some interesting comments that I'm sure we'll talk about later about like how he even views like the, the Jamar Chase Panay Sewell conversation from a few years ago. I think we we're going to be in a similar in a similar scenario um, this this upcoming draft. Um, I, I, I just think that more than anything, though, um, what I'm what I'm excited about um, in the new regime that I think Vrabel got a gets a bad rap on. I don't think it's totally true, but the the ups- the, the sheer prioritization of getting the ball in your best player's hands consistently, like guys who aren't named, obviously he won't be with, I don't expect him to be with the team, but guys who aren't named Derrick Henry, getting the ball in your playmaker's hands um, and, and making sure your playmakers are on the field. There were a lot of, you know, like 13 personnel formations where we were literally telegraphing what we were going to do because we had a four string wide receiver on the field because he was a better bro- blocker than DeAndre Hopkins. Like just th- that type of, that type of, um, obsession in terms of even down to the details of personnel um, is, is something I'm excited about out of, out of Callahan. Yeah. And, and you mentioned uh, Will Levis being the most important player on the team. 
I'm kind of curious your outlook for him. We, we all know he started hot, uh, came in that first game throwing four touchdowns over 200 yards, but then followed it up with the next seven games only throwing a combined four touchdowns. So what's your outlook on him? Is he a franchise quarterback for you guys? Are you optimistic? What's what's going on there? Totally, yeah. And, I, um, I, yeah, started super hot, very exciting. And then, yeah, statistically definitely, like, tapered off a bit. I, I think that just in general when we're talking second-year quarterbacks, it, I think it's – and I don't think this is insightful per se, but it's the hardest thing to do is is go into your second year and, and, and build on whatever you did in your rookie year because now there's a year's worth of tape on you, or at least in Will's case, about a half year's worth of tape. I will say about Will Levis – um, what, what was exciting to see as a fan was just f- physically, I think there's everything you would want there. Um, um, great athlete. I think his pocket presence, I'm, I'm certainly not a, a college scout or talent evaluator, but his, his pocket presence was, was extremely encouraging based on everything I had kind of read and just a little bit I had seen from, from some of his Kentucky tape. Um, and um, lead, leadership is there and toughness is there. So I think those are just some of the intangibles that like you hope to see just at a base level, not even getting into how many touchdowns he threw later in the season. What what I love about Will is just his sheer, and this kind of goes into, you know, how do you respond to, to defensive coaches who have now have, have tape on you and have been sitting with you all off season. Um, total, total gym rat, total tape, total like tape rat. Loved, loves the game, obsessed with football, super smart. Um, what I also love seeing him in his early games, he had he had just as much control in terms of just like liberated control at the line of scrimmage that that like Tannehill had. And Tannehill had been our quarterback for several years. He was canning plays early. He was he was truly being a general at the line of scrimmage. Time will tell, you know, obviously like how he pans out. But I would also say. Um, you know, from an offensive line perspective, we were horrendous. Yeah. Like tragically bad last worst year. Worst in the league. Yeah. We're, we're, no, and, and, yeah. yeah. Our, our left tackle situation, I think both Jalen Duncan and Andre Dillard, the guys who got the majority of stats, were both one and two, I think, in sacks allowed. Um, there, there was no consistency on the line of scrimmage in terms of offensive linemen. Um, we were undersized in general, I think, especially on the interior. Peter Skaronsky was recovered from an appendectomy for half the season. Um, so I, I think overall, like the hiring of Bill Callahan as well, just to be our offensive line coach is, is a substantial, was a substantial move. I, I think that the more we surround Will with talent, um, and that's, again, that's obvious with any player, but I, I think he has the chops to, to be a, a, a serious, a serious quarterback in the league and, and, and our franchise guy. I'm, I'm hopeful for it. I, I see it more than I had seen it with our previous, I guess high investment quarterbacks of of Mariota and 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 uh, my Malik young. and Malik Mal- Malik I mean, yeah. Malik I God bless Malik and like hard worker <laughs> great dude but uh, um I I don't think he has a place in in the league yeah um yeah so I, my take on Levis first of all don't sell yourself short on not being a college scout I I think anyone <laughs> listening to this knows you can talk ball you know what you're talking about Thank you. um and a lot of that is confidence right like Levis to me. I agree with you. I think he showed to be extremely confident in the pocket. And I think that he definitely, given the right situation, can be an NFL quarterback. I mean, just from like confidence in his arm as well. Um, he was one thing the Titans needed to change was letting the ball rip a little bit and give Hop McCompkins a chance. And that's what Levis did. And that's why you saw uh, some of that success in the first game. I mean, you know, he, he, Threw a couple balls there, just like let me get, let me trust my wide receiver who is the most talented on the field uh, that he'll go up and get it. And that's honestly, he never had a great quarterback when he was with the Texans. It was just trusting that he was the best player in that matchup, and it led to success. Titans weren't giving him those chances early in the season, but Levis did because he trusted his arm. So I do think, you know, from a confidence standpoint, it's there. From a tool standpoint, like you said, it's there. Now it's pair him with Callahan, who's a great offensive coach, a great offensive mind. You already mentioned earlier what he did with Browning when Burrow went down. Uh, so let's see what he can make happen here in this next phase of the Titans, um, you, you know, the Titans franchise. No, definitely. And like just DeAndre Hopkins, obviously Hall, Hall of Famer, but what, what, a, what, a, what a privilege it is. And obviously I watched him destroy us for 
however long he was in Houston twice a year. But like, what a privilege watching that man play. Just, just a, what an absolute, especially on a team that lacked, especially in the wide receiver room, veteran presence. You know, I, I think o- overall, like we we had we had struggled with bringing in vets. Like the Julio Jones experiment blew up in our face. Like DeAndre Hopkins was was as advertised all off season, and then just the way he plays football, man, just a, a joy to watch. And and for him to for him to we, to have a guy like that on the field with, with Levis in his earliest games was yeah, you can't you can't ask for more. So you mentioned Malik Willis. Are, are you comfortable this year going in with Willis as your number two, or would you rather see somebody like a Dobbs or a Minshew or a Darnold be brought in, or could that be a detriment to the de- development of Will Levis if it's somebody like that or Jacoby Percet that if he has to come in for a quarter or a game and he looks good and, and won, then it's then they kind of stick with that type of level of person. Sure. No, it's a good question. I mean, mo- with res- again, I mean, it's res- respect to Malik. This guy works his tail off. Good dude. I- I'm not comfortable having him as our number two. Like, I- I'm I'm personally ready to kind of move on from from Malik Willis. I would love to see us invest in in a veteran backup, primarily first and foremost for just like the cliche coach on the coach on the field element. Um, I'm not look if if a Brissett just to pick Brissett out of the list. If a Brissett comes in and, and and Levis is struggling and Brissett comes in and plays better with with Brissett, that's on Levis. So I, I'm not, I'm not, that would be a shame with respect to Jacoby, a Jacoby Brissett or a Sam Darnold. But like, if you're going to be a franchise guy, you're not going to lose your job to, to a journeyman backup. Um, I, I think that the, the value of having a guy like that though, like assuming Levis does indeed, you know, take the, take the take the job take the starting job by the horns and establish himself as our true franchise guy. Having having some having a veteran in the room, and I have no doubt about Levis's preparation. But it's just be that beacon of this is how you prepare as a vet week in week out. This is how you take care of your body. A, a second a second coach on the field, like I said, um, I'm, I'm all about it. I, yeah, I, I think- hope we do invest because we. We've kind of skimped on the investment of a backup quarterback in the past few years, um, and and it's bitten us in the it's bitten us in the in the tail. Yeah, I think from a preparation standpoint, it's important. And as we saw last year, I mean, how many injuries did went down? Um, I, I don't know if that's because the edge rushers are becoming just next level athletes in attacking the quarterback position, or if that's. Um, you know what that is alluding to these quarterback injuries, but having that veteran step in so that so the uh, season's not fully lost is also an important um, point. So, yeah. Um, so let's transition to the pass catchers. Uh, we talked a little bit about quarterbacks, but uh, I know you mentioned how much of a privilege it is to uh, watch DeAndre Hopkins play. But um, it, following up with that wide receiver room, you know, um, Traylon Burks uh, still a young prospect in the NFL. And then uh, Nick Westbrook Akine um, didn't really provide much help. So I, you know, there's there's rumblings around the NFL that the Titans might sign a wide receiver, bring in some veteran. What do you think they should do to uh, beef up this wide receiver room to get Will Levis some help? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And like Nick Westbrook Akina, undrafted free agent out of Indiana, like worked his tail off. Very much a variable guy. I don't expect him back. Like, kind of like again, like total respect for the guy. It never was should never have been put in the position that he was he was he was kind of handed um and that was a Vrabel thing and 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 the, Nick Nick is one of a few players that that kind of benefited from from just being a super hard worker um Traylon Burks I'm out on him and and I I'm I, he's unfortunately dealt with some very serious concussions but um you know, trading AJ Brown was the worst personnel decision in Tennessee Titans history, um, and 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 it's unfair that like that's kind of who you're being compared to if if you're trailing Burks, but um, just you know zero, damn near zero explosion, inconsistent hands. Unfortunately, can't stay healthy. Obviously, you can't do anything about concussions, but like if you really want to scrutinize it, like does not play balanced. Um, I, I, I was ready to ship Traylon Burks at, at the, at the trade deadline this past year. So like respectful, again, respectfully to these players, 
I look at our wide receiver room and I see DeAndre Hopkins penciled in next year and like maybe Kyle Phillips. Um, what I would like us to do, um, a guy, and I, I think he'll become available if he's not ready. I, I like I have like Tyler Boyd penciled in um, out, out of Cincinnati. Obviously, this is a consistent thing from Callahan. Not not the sexiest name. I know like Calvin Ridley's the headline right now, and like I'm not going to be mad about investing in Calvin Ridley. Um, I, I think this team desperately needs, um, you know, or just a revamp room at, at whole. But I think a guy like Tyler Boyd would come with, you know, obviously just like a lower salary requirement, but but can be extremely productive surrounded by other talented guys. Um, he's a good ball player on his own. I hope to see us invest in kind of that maybe second wave of wide receiver free agency. I know that sounds maybe a little like counterproductive given how terrible our room is. But um, if I'm if I'm our GM, Rand Carthon, I, I'm eyeballing a guy like Boyd. Like Darnell Mooney would be like my, okay, we didn't get Boyd. Well, we got Darnell, respectfully. I'm saying that a lot. Um, yeah. I, I'm hopeful we go receiver at seven. As much as, as much as, you know, I'm not, I would, I would be very happy with, you know, a guy like Joe Walt if he's there or, I know it's a very deep tackle and receiver class in general, but but my hope is is to is to get a kind of that second tier free agent receiver and and invest at seven, whether you know whoever may still be there. Because I again, who knows stay, how the draft is. Stay go. away from Malik Neighbors, okay? He's yeah, coming to the Bears. Neighbor, so. Neighbors is definitely <laughs> stay uh, away. I would, I would I would uh, I would run to the podium, but I, I know knowing knowing the Titans is uh, I. I we we do love uh, Adunza, Adunze, Aduns, Adunze, yeah. yeah. Adunze. Uh, so you mentioned like it's not fair to compare him to AJ Brown, and that was a horrible personnel decision. Part of that per that that being a horrible por personnel decision is that was the situation the franchise put Burks in. It was like we get rid of AJ totally. to bring in the next wide receiver one. Well, he's one of the best wide receivers in the league, so that follow-up act is going to have to live up to those expectations, and that's just – they dug their own grave there in my mind. That's Absolutely. like a bad bad front office move on their part. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I agree that they need to make a move. I think Higgins would have probably been the preferred option if he hit the market, uh, given the tie to Callahan, given he's – potentially a wide receiver one i mean we haven't seen that yet with chase being there but you would think he has that skill set um and like let's not uh, let's not sugarcoat it the titans are in the middle of a rebuild um so best man available at seven makes sense but like let's not let's not go blow our load on a receiver that is not a true wide receiver one and then just be sitting here again uh you know in a year or two or like all right we have this contract and he's not living living up to it you know yeah no, I and mean, i think that's kind of like something that you know you're not wide receiver a true wide receiver one is never going to be a, a detriment but i just think in general you you're, you're needing more and more guys who can win one-on-ones um the only guy was we've ever had really in the past maybe since Derek Mason that have been able to consistently win one-on-ones has been AJ Brown and, and Deandre Hopkins. Like Corey Davis wasn't even that, that type of guy. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm ready. I'm ready to revamp that room. I'm ready for certain guys, particularly this guy, Kyle Phillips to get more of a chance than he did under Vrabel. But um, on the same token, like, Tr tr it, look, if, if Callahan and crew can, and Tyke Tolbert can unlock, Traylon Burks, I'm not going to be mad about it, but I, I think that like the comparison to AJ is totally like the unfairness of that is is totally a thing. But but Traylon's getting 45 snaps a game and not commanding a single target, which is fun to watch. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk transition to the biggest topic of the offseason, I think, for the Titans, of course, and that's Derrick Henry. Um, Real quick, just kind of a, a quick recap of the season. You know, um, for us, I know from a fantasy fantasy perspective, we we saw because we all three talked throughout the year on this that you know his big games were very positive game script driven. So when they were very tight in games or had leads in the games, he had big games. Um, when they were not, he had you know some rough games. Um, which kind of led to his, you know, I think it was his lowest or second lowest yards per game season of his career. Um, so, A, let's just talk about 
uh, Henry, are, are you kind of in agreement that uh, they should not be bringing him back? It's time to transition to somebody new. And then is that Ty J Spears or is that Ty J Spears and a 1B running back? Yeah, no, I mean, look, first, Derrick Henry, nothing but the maddest love and, and appreciation. Like, what a, what a joy and privilege to watch him play football. Um, and and uh, an ultimate pro and, an all, and a phenomenal, you know, ambassador of the team and the organization. Um, I, I think that there's still juice in the tank for sure. I, I think that um, – and I, I don't even want to talk finances because, like, you know, you pay guys or you pay guys and, you know, whatever. Um, he he will command a, a a hefty check, but whatever. I, I think that, um, you know, we remain too centric around Derrick Henry over the past few years, even when he was still you know producing like two thousand yard season. I know that sounds silly, but our 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 team like we couldn't do anything, and this is also a a a, a, de- a problem with Tannehill. But like we couldn't do anything unless Derrick was producing. Um, we, we never were able to establish a drop back passing game with Tannehill. Um, and that was part Tannehill, probably part personnel, part coaching and, and, and game plan approach. I, I, I think that right now in, um, with Derrick Henry, Derrick is a two down back. Um, and that, and that wasn't, that was the case prior to, to Spears coming on. Um, Derrick has always struggled in pass pro and just as a pass catcher, we 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 were obsessed with getting the ball in his hands, and that's not necessarily the wrong thing to do. But even drawing up screens that were were never going to work. So I I almost think that like yes, coaching staff is different, but I also think we kind of need to be liberated from Derek a little bit. Um, when you have such a, a a phenomenal player that kind of needs to play a certain way, you know, you're, you're pigeonholing. I think the, the the remaining ten guys to an extent. Um, I, I think, like I said, I think he has a role in the league 100. percent I think there's probably two or three years more in the tank. Um, I, I hope, just as a fan of Derek, I, I I hope that he's able to continue producing. Um, but I, from a Titans perspective, I, I'm ready to move on. I think Spears is is a piece. I, I think he's. Um, I think he would be benefited by by another guy just. Just, I think that's part of the way the league is going is what the league has been going. For sure. um, if Joe Mixon gets let go, I think that's an that's an obvious potential. Just again, another Callahan thing. But um, Spears himself runs way harder than you know physically he might look. Great pass pro already. Very natural pass catcher. Um, so we're, I think we're able to, to run a lot. We're, we're, I don't think our, our running game is going to need to be totally reskinned with, with Spears and another guy. Um, I just think that with a guy like Derek and just kind of his, his physical gifts, but at the same time, there are some limitations. Um, we as an offense can't be as deceptive when he's on the field. Um, and I know that sounds silly. For a guy that is literally the gener- his gener- a generational talent, and I will be at his Canton induction. <laughs> um, but I, I just, I, I genuinely do think it's time, and 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 um, and that's just kind of how 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 sports work. Yeah, I so I have a I have a follow up, kind of piggyback on Shane and um, your takes there, like the Titans offense. I wouldn't say it was like too reliant on the Derrick Henry dynamic, but they were kind of game script driven as a team. Listen, they were number one in the AFC, uh, you know, looked like that was their year to potentially make something happen, but they kind of got topped out, right? Like if they didn't have, if games weren't trailing that game script, then they just weren't going to win. They, the Tannehill wasn't going to, you know, come from behind two touchdowns and, uh, you know, light the team on light, light the defense on fire with his arm. So they seemed to be kind of topped out, um, based on that dynamic, just relying on him running the ball down your throat. Granted, he was a generational running back in just size alone, size and athletic ability alone, right? Um, he's that Steph Curry type player who just brings a whole different dynamic to the game um, and almost changes it in a way. So um, that's kind of my take on Henry there. Uh, Yeah. And Spears, like he has that explosion 
I think I think you you see that the the Cowboys helmet right behind Shane's shoulder. Like I could see him being a Tony Pollard to a Zeke, where he gets the ball fifteen to twenty times a game and has that ability to make big plays. And you kind of keep him there without trying to make him a bell cow, which he may may just not be in the league. So that's kind of where I see him having the most success as a player in the Titans. Um, you know, with this next Callahan type offense role. Yeah. And I, 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 th- I think I, I agree. Um, and, and, and what did you like, it's been, a, it was, it was awesome watching Spears play as well. This, this past off season. Like I think he and Hopkins were really, and I'll say Levis like, but Spears especially are, are, are the shiniest rookie in terms of, in terms of who, who we had last season. So I, I'm, I'm excited to see him and in a little bit a larger role, but agree completely that that there should be some complimentary running back play in in nashville yeah mixon would be a great fit i like that um or like a singletary um if he yeah. becomes loose i think singletary from what i've heard is likely going to be back in houston uh with a potential like deandre swift addition to that running back room um but yeah little birdie told me that they're not looking for saquon um and, and want to go that singletary plus route Houston's done a nice job as much as it pains me as a nice <laughs> job building a, a little squad down there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you, you guys have uh, a lot of salary cap room, right? You guys have a, yeah. a, a r- roughly around 80 million second most salary cap in the NFL. Where do you want to see them spend that money? Uh, particularly let's focus on the offensive side of the ball for right now. Um, where would you like to see them spend that money? I know you mentioned a Joe Mixon. Uh, you mentioned a word offensive shooter, line. They, yeah, just yeah, carry. yeah, and like I, I don't, I don't necessarily have like a list of names. Uh, I, I'm actually, I was actually on uh on, on my on my little forum. I was talking about this earlier. Offensively, like I mentioned, receiver. Obviously, like I, I personally would prefer kind of that second wave guy. Um, I'm not going to be like if Calvin Ridley is is the kind of the golden ticket this among the current guys that are likely available. Um, I'm not going to be mad about adding a talent like Calvin Ridley to the team um, running back. Like I said, you know, I, I think a, a complimentary piece, um, you know, mi- mix in makes sense, but a complimentary piece offensive line. It, it, it's, it's very interesting to see how we actually, we, we um, approach it because we have, I'm not trying to put too much credence into like Bill Callahan's water and a wine skill set as an offensive line coach, but um there are a couple guys, Dylan Radunes, um, we took him in the second round a few years ago. Um, he's he's kind of been bounced around the, the offensive line a bit. He plays he can play guard or tackle, came off a torn ACL from last season, played all right this past year. And, and Nicholas Petit Ferrer, who was at all um, third round offensive tackle out of Ohio State. This was his second year this past year. He uh missed the first six games because of like gambling and then um busted his shoulders like those are two guys that in theory and i say that solely in theory um could be our next right guard and right tackle um i have a feeling they're going to be on the outside looking in and that's just kind of my gut we invested in andre dillard last year at offensive tackle left tackle he was a fail a failed experiment however he's still on the roster i i i think i hope i hope we do go tackle within one of our first two draft picks. Um, so I, I think in general, then to, to actually answer your question now, I really would like to see us um, make a concerted effort at at signing a, a proper starting center. Um, we've had a guy, no disrespect to Aaron Brewer, um, very much a Vrabel guy, another undrafted <laughs> free agent that just worked his tail off. Excellent run blocker, excellent athlete, but a total liability in pass pro. Um, I, I think we need, we need a, we need a a proper NFL center. Um, left guard is going to be Skaronsky, hopefully for the next 10, 12 years. Um, I, I, I want to just see us bring in more and more competition across the offensive line and, and bring in some guys that, that have, um, and again, this is easier said than done, but like guys that, that do have some games under their belt as starters. We, we have rolled the dice, like I said, on Andre Dillard last year, who, was kind of a failed first round pick in Philadelphia and, and did not had not started or played much as well as Daniel Brunskill, who was our right guard last year and played well out of San Francisco. 
Um, but another, he was a guy that was a backup in San Francisco that got a chance to start in Tennessee. I don't, I don't think Daniel Brunskill is, was a liability, but I think that's a guy you want as a backup to be able to play any of the three interior offensive line positions. Um, so again, like we, we have a lot of guys that, that still make sense to like see it, see if they can earn a spot, um, especially with a new coaching staff. But, but I would like to draft tackle and, yeah. and, and, and invest free agency wise in, um, the interior offensive line. That said, yeah. again, if we're able to snag a great tag, I don't know. I don't even know. I don't think many are available, but whether it's, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think my takeaway from that is you would like to see them drafted tackle. So let's say let's say they go in and get Boyd or a wide receiver. Um, then maybe you lean away from neighbors and take Alt with that number seven pick uh, and then sign a, a, a center in free agency. Or let's say you miss out on the on that wide receiver uh, addition and think that the potential of having, a wide receiver one and neighbors and a dunes they are there and grabbing one of them and then adding that tackle what second round is uh, it, what's your what's your perfect world for uh, positional needs filled in the draft I yeah guess. um regardless of really regardless of free agency um in no order but like receiver tackle corner um i, I know like and, and even then not to, I don't want to, I know we want to keep the free agency talks mostly offensively, but like, I would love to, we need, we need some, we need a veteran presence at corner and linebacker desperately. Um, and, and I hope that is somewhere we look in, in free agency. Um, but um, draft wise, those are, those are three positions that, that I'm hope I'm hoping that we really do hammer and it, it sucks. I think it would be silly to go into a draft being like, we need to hit receiver and tackle with our first two picks, but I think we are there from a, a straight up roster perspective. And then corner, we I don't I don't think we're gonna have basically our, our top three, our top three corners going to last year was Christian Fulton out of LSU, um, who will not be with the team next year. Um, Sean Murphy Bunting, who was on a one year deal out of Tampa, I thought he played well, but what I'm hearing from from my people is that Bunting won't be back. And then Roger McCreary, who um, was last year was his second year. He's a slot corner, so McCreary can play. McCreary, McCreary belongs, but we're going to have two gaping holes at, at outside at, at outside corner, as far as I'm concerned. Within the next two weeks, uh, that'll be made very clear. I think Bunting and Fulton will be gone. Um, so those are those are the three positions that I really have penciled in. I, I think that. You know, it, it, it sucks kicking the can on edge. Um, Harold Landry is a, a great football player um, and, and bounced back extremely quickly and extremely e efficiently from an eight torn ACL. Um, we went into last season with Arden Key, who it might who who can play, but I, I would I would prefer him more in a situational role than than playing thirty five snaps a game. Um, edge would kind of be my fourth position a need um to, to to look at in the draft but you, you you can't have enough edge rushers um yeah so kind of bringing this full sort circle we'll talk to the about the division in a second but uh given the titans where they're currently at um given the rebuild that they're currently going through what does that rebuild look like in your mind uh you know when can we be competing for the division, the playoffs, and uh, what does a su successful season to you look like this next year? Totally, yeah. I mean, sorry, uh, ever anything can happen overnight in the NFL. Like worst to first happen, I don't necessarily think that's going to be the case for us. Um, what I would view as success next year is one, like straight up being more competitive in the division. I, I think we went one and one and seven last year, one and five last year in the division. Houston, Houston slapped us around. Indy slapped us around. Jacksonville, we we did get at the at the end of the season, but like curb stomped us when we played them um, in, in Jacksonville. So like I, I want to just see a little bit more just genuine level of competitive competitiveness within the division. You want to see growth from Levis. Um, and and right now like you, do, you want to see continued growth from some of our young players. Um, we went within, with our previous regime, 
we went drafts without, I think, maybe two or three drafts in a row where not a single player will get a second contract or get, or or they're already gone. So like we we drafted so abysmally, abysm, if abysmally is a word, starting in 2020, really the, the April 2020 draft after we went to the AFC title game was the beginning of the end of, of the last era of Titans football. Um, so I, I, I just hope and I'm hopeful that we're able to um, in, inject some youthful talent in this team that, that starts developing, obviously Levis more than anyone next year and, and start seeing some more, some more veteran presences establishing themselves as leaders on the team. I, if look, I, I would love to win like eight or nine, I, of course you want an every game, but like if we can scratch out eight or nine games next year and just be kind of a, a middling team that, that competes, um, week in, week out. I'm anxious to see how Callahan does as a head coach, especially more of a situational football role. There's going to be there's going to be a huge learning curve there, um, where Vrabel excelled until he didn't. Um, so I, you, you just again saying I want to see a competitive team is a cliche, but I, I do think we need to be more competitive in our own division, and we need to see young players actually progressing and and getting better year in year out because we went several years. Where, where that just straight up wasn't happening. And that's why we're in the position we are now. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk big picture, right? Um, not just next year, but, you know, the next decade. Looking at the division, um, how optimistic are you? It's It's got to be tough because you have Trevor Lawrence, who is yeah. uh, an insane talent. You have C.J. Stroud, who absolutely exploded his rookie year. And then you also have uh, Anthony Richardson, who – you know, dealing with injuries, but still looked uh, incredibly dominant on the football field. Having Will Levis, like, how do you how do you have any optimism over the next decade in this division? And I'm sorry to put it that way, but that's just my opinion about the Titans. It's like it's tough sure. um, with that outlook. So I'm just curious, big picture, yeah. what your opinion is. No, it's coming like, from a Bears fan who's just been tortured the last ten years. Yeah. Too. No, it, look, it's a, it's a it's it's a it is what it's a, it's, it's the landscape of the AFC South, you know? And it's like, I think we were a punching bag of a division for a couple of years, but then, you know, last year's draft happens and, and, and three of the four teams get a new quarterback and the fourth team had, you know, has Trevor Lawrence. So look, uh, it's going to come down to Levis. I might be, whether it's rose colored glasses or not, but like, I, 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 I'm, I believe that Levis has the capability to be, a, a very good NFL quarterback. Um, well, you know, I, I think Stroud is probably the crown jewel of the division, but let's just assume for conversation's sake, let's assume all four become their respective team's guy. If Stroud's the best, if Levis is four, third, or whatever, like whatever, um, all four teams will be competitive. And I think that's one that's very fun as a fan. Like as much as as much as you know, you would love like a cakewalk to the playoffs every year, which I think we kind of had briefly. You want to see you want to see good competitive big time division games. So like from an entertainment perspective, that's awesome. I think it's gonna I think it's gonna come down to to team building and how we're able to retain a coaching staff. You know, and and uh, look, I have the utmost faith in C.J. Stroud. I like I think he's gonna be a great quarterback regardless, but like. If and when slow it goes, that's going to be a huge transition. And they're going to eventually have to pay guys like any team for real, like yeah. any team. Calvin Ridley is no longer going to be a Jacksonville Jaguar. You know, it's like like the attrition happens that quickly. Michael P Michael Pittman might not be a Colt next year. You know, it's like Jonathan Taylor was this close to not being a Colt. So like just the straight up roster attrition, it, it's going to be on our front office, going to be on Rand Carthon. Um and just general team building outside the quarterback position because yeah, it's easy to say, Oh, they got Stroud, they got Lawrence, whatever. But a lot of teams have very good quarterbacks with, with surrounding rosters around them that might not be up to snuff and, and they're, they're not winning their division with, they're not winning their division year in year out. So I, I think that, you know, Levis, Levis will to an extent be as good as the team around him. Um, I, what I, what I'm, what I'm appreciative of, in terms of the front office moves we've made over the past year and a half, once John Robinson, our previous GM, got fired after the Eagles game in 2022, um, we we've made a concerted effort at at um, bringing in like actual analytics into how we evaluate talent, 
when we when we draft and sign guys, we were notorious for being probably last in the league in in size of analytics department. That's not an end all be all solve, but we're making it. We're making a concerted effort to kind of get in with the times a little bit. Um, the way we're approaching drafting and scouting is evolving significantly from the previous regime. Um, meaning, and this is a very Titans fans would laugh because this is a cliche, a more collaborative environment, which was definitely the case in Cincinnati. They have, I think, like the smallest scouting department in the NFL. They rely on assistant coaches to play that role a lot. But that's that's where Kalian's come from. That's what he's um, – that's part of the reason he was hired, to come in and be kind of more of that true collaborator with our GM, Rand Carthon, that that I think, you know, Vrabel was, did not have much interest in being. Um, so uh, I, it comes down to just straight-up roster building – um, obviously quarterback play will, will dictate how many games we win to, 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 to its respective extent. Um, and, 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 you know, to go back kind of loop de loop to the coaching conversation, I'm excited to have an offensive minded head coach that will be our play caller and will be attached to Levis. And again, CJ Stroud doesn't have that. That's not to say anything about CJ Stroud's next, the rest of his career, but he will almost he will almost certainly go through a little bit more new guys in the building, new coaches than 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 Will Levis will. Obviously, Doug Peterson and Steichen are going to be the guys in 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 their respective quarterbacks years for as long as they're in in Jacksonville and, and Indianapolis. But um, yeah, it's a super competitive division. But um, I'm 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 ready for it. I'm ready for the smoke. Yeah, truck. You forgot that we started this episode with. Uh, VT becoming a, fan, a diehard fan because he was crying about their uh, <laughs> their shortcomings. So I think, um, you know, I, I think that's noteworthy. But yeah, I mean, it's not the AFC North, right? Um, it doesn't have Lamar Jackson, Joe Burrow, um, Deshaun Watson. That's a different, you know, conversation that we don't need to get into. But it's not the NF AFC North with how tough those defenses defenses are and those two, you know, MVP two two time MVP and then Joe Burrow, who's just, you know, I think everyone would say a top five quarterback in the NFL. Um, Stroud does look like he is that guy. Um, Trevor Lawrence is has not really been lived up to his talent and lived up to his potential. He's been pretty underwhelming. Um, so there's question marks there. And then you guys know my thoughts on Anthony Richardson. I don't think he's a franchise quarterback. So, uh, yeah, he does have Steichen, and that's uh, very promising. But um, from just his talent, his arm, uh, his accuracy, I don't think it's there, and I just don't think it's coming. But, um, yeah, I mean, Titans, like VT said, they need to make uh, progress every year. They need either Levis to be the guy or cut bait and move on. Um, but – seeing his progress this year is very important sharing up that offensive line and then just continuing to develop talent and let Callahan um, build that culture and, and, and continue to evolve that offense is kind of, you know, next steps. So it's that easy. Yeah. And uh, to, just to follow up with what Mike was saying, um, talking about the AFC North and stuff, I think what you guys can do to really have an upper hand in this division is, is uh, beef up the trenches. Like if you guys are able to get the best offensive line, the best defensive line in the division, which right now that's achievable. Uh, Houston's defense definitely took a step forward last year, but uh, you know, they're all kind of in the same pool for me. If you guys are able to figure that out this next season, maybe the year after, really um, take control of the trenches within the division, I think you guys have a good shot at uh, at really being competitive. So, yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, and hopefully, because like that was that was that was our bread and butter. Like that was when we were when we were a very good, and I'll say like when we were a very good to great team. Like we were great in the offensive line, great in the defensive line. Like. I can't imagine you want me to go into specifics about those draft whiffs, but like that's <laughs> why our offensive line is in the position it is right now. Um, and it's it's in total shambles. Defensive line, Jeffrey Simmons, great player. Harold Andrew, great player. Danico Autry will probably be gone, but like great, great player. But like not not a dominant front anymore. Um, I'm anxious to see Denard Wilson as our defense coordinator. I, I like our previous defensive staff, um, but but I'm, I'm excited to see um, how we approach. And it's funny you mentioned the trenches because – um, offensive line is obvious, but, but I, I do want to see us improve, invest a little more heavily in, in the interior defensive line. Obviously we have Simmons making a ton of money and Simmons is a great player. Um, I, I think, um, I think that over the past few years, we've 
we've kind of done a lot of like respectfully, like the Nick Westbrook Aquina versions of like guys that work really hard um, and that just earned a spot that were getting a lot of snaps um, that were cheap, often undrafted free agents. Um, and and I, I think that I think that we need to invest a little bit more in the interior defensive line than, than we have in the past few years as well, because Simmons is one guy. I, I think he's a, a, a phenomenal player on his best day. I don't think he's as as week in week out dominant as someone like maybe the like a Chris Jones or again these are the, the best of the best at their positions. Um, I think Simmons is just a, a tick behind, but that 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 especially is is a role I, I hope we we look to invest in from a veteran presence perspective and free agencies interior defensive line. Well, I will say this: there is something that Tennessee is the best in the NFL with, and uh, I don't think it's any question. But their throwback Oilers uniforms are number one in the league, <laughs> not challenged by any other team. They are top in the league, I believe. They're hot, and I appreciate that. And it was awesome. It was all aw- we had a little bit of a, um, we we hit we had the highs and lows wearing them last year. We had obviously <laughs> Levis wore them in his debut and, and lit it up, and it was like mm-hmm. this is this is awesome. <laughs> this is this is how every game is going to be. And uh, then we we lost the heartbreaker to Houston, where where Levis actually missed a, a wide open Traylon Burks and uh, forced a bad forced a bad pick on trying to get the ball to DeAndre that took that sent the game in a totally different direction. And then Houston being all salty that there are jerseys, blah blah blah. <laughs> I was not I was not partially I wasn't alive for most of it, though I was I wasn't alive for most of the Oiler uh, franchise. Um, and and like I said, I I missed the Tennessee Oilers fandom so I'm, I'm not admittedly into a fault i'm not much educated about the the relationship there other than the, the headlines but um it was it it hurt my soul to have houston fans kind of get us get us as good as they got this past year especially mm-hmm. as we were wearing the oiler jerseys against them yeah i love it um well i'm good i think we did a great job covering the team um from a to z vince you know you know the team in and out. You answered all of our questions. Um, I think the listeners are going to have a very good view of what needs to happen and what to look out for here this week in free agency uh, and then coming up in the draft. So uh, loved having you on. Love talking to you as always. Um, I'll be back in Chicago in a few months, hopefully. And cool. Love to, uh, you know, let's get – get jay harks to have Let's us all, it, yeah. have us all over and, and and get back together and Let's uh do it. um but yeah so um we're gonna you know if, if you would come back on and talk titans with us throughout the year i know the people need their titans talk so <laughs> yeah. as yeah. as the storylines develop uh let's yeah. get into it no, appreciate it. Thank you guys. Obviously, calls great, great seeing you guys, Truck and Shane. Great meeting you vir- virtually. Congrats on the show. Great show. Thanks for having me on. Um, enjoyed our enjoyed our convo much. Uh, hope the Bears and, and Cowboys have a have a fun rest of the off season and and, and good twenty twenty four. But yeah, um, I, you you got my number. Whenever yep. uh, whenever the world is knocking on the door for for oh. what's going on in Nashville. Yeah, you, know, you know who to you know who to you know who to who to hit up. Final take. Let's let, let's plug. Uh, it's pronounced Taki. We first of all, we need more videos. Sure, yeah, that needs to come. Give us uh, give us a little rundown of that. What you're working on there, uh, and you know we're gonna we're we're gonna do our best to um, shoot it out to our network and get the roadies on board because it's you know. Uh, Thank I view, you. I view you as one of the funnier people that I know. Um, so I, you know I'm excited to see what's to come. I appreciate that much, and thanks. Yeah, and I, I agree. We uh, hopefully we're we're shooting again soon in this this spring. Um, but it's pronounced Taki is uh, um, a little. It, it's on YouTube and Instagram, um, like a comedy short series um, about my my life's experiences. Very much kind of like snapshot, mini mini moments. Episodes are just you know ninety seconds to a couple minutes. Um, a buddy of mine and I have been producing over the past year. It's a little bit of a passion project about myself, just you know, reflecting my life through through more of a comedic lens. I uh, have a lot of fun with it, and uh, like I said, and, and Cole said, you know, unfortunately, haven't had a few, haven't had any new episodes in a few months here, but uh, hopefully, we're shooting again soon. Been working on some scripts, and uh, it's just it's been a fun way to uh, to express myself comedically. And, and I got a great buddy who's very talented behind the camera um, that that's been fun to work on it with my buddy Jay Sheets. So there's his respective plug. 
<laughs> the pride of Italy, ladies and gentlemen. Truck, why don't you sign us out? Thank you, guys. Yeah, yeah, Vince, thanks you very much. Uh, and make sure everybody go check out It's Pronounced Taki on YouTube and, uh, and Instagram. And uh, we appreciate you for clicking on the video. Please like and subscribe to the channel. Um, Coles, do you have anything else before I sign us out so you don't interrupt me as no. I'm getting to our tagline? No? No, I'm nothing? good. So that happens a lot, VT, but no, I'm good. <laughs> Does it all all the time, almost every episode. But thanks, Wait, guys. Actually, uh, okay. UCA, let's go. UCA, UCA. let's go Bears. Shout go out, Bears. shout out, Jordan Harks. Um, <laughs> uh, thanks again, everybody, and uh, remember as always, Buffalo.